here in SIL. And to talk about the mission of SIL, here we have our very own head of school, Mark Silver. All right, let's give these kids another round of applause before we get started. What? You know, just coming in here tonight, so this is, uh, I was just talking with Eden. We think this is about nine or 10 years ago that we started, initially it started with a, it is something called a capstone project, and then it's evolved over the last nine or 10 years. And to come into this space tonight and to like walk around and to see the posters and to see how confident and articulate and thoughtful each of these kids are. And for most of you, these are your kids. I, you know, I always think eighth grade is such a great year, and I love watching that transition as they grow from the beginning of eighth grade to like you're a little over halfway through eighth grade right now. You guys are a really impressive group of kids. And so again, it's so excited for them to be able to showcase tonight the work they've been doing. So I've been told that I was supposed to talk about the mission of SIL. So what is the mission of SIL? Um, you know, as I said, it has roots in this idea of like a capstone project and the idea that you're trying to bring together a whole series of things that you've been learning ever since you joined Hillbrook, whether that was in junior kindergarten or fifth grade or sixth grade or seventh grade, whatever that was, all of those different things are coming together in this project. And in particular, I think there's three things that are worth noting. One is at the heart of this are the core questions, what matters to you and what are you doing about it? And so as you walked around and you saw kids tonight, as, and, and again, by the way, this is just the start. There's a whole series of presentations after this, but as you had a chance to at least get a glimpse at what they're doing, you get a sense of like all the different passions. There's so many topics that students are covering, and that's by design. Like, you know, this is, we're giving them an opportunity to really think about something that matters to them. It's something that doesn't, for, you know, for many people, they hit later ages, and we often talk about um, one of the biggest problems that colleges say they have are students who show up in college and have no idea what they care about because nobody's ever asked them that question. It's really important to actually ask kids that question. And then the second part of this, what, what are they doing? It's a really complicated project. And they learned a lot of project management skills. And they learned a lot of that, in some cases, because it went really well. <laughs> and then in other cases, because it didn't go so well. And that's a really important lesson. That's a super critical learning of like how like, huh, like what, are, and so as you go through tonight and you have a chance to hear the kids talk, you'll actually hear a little bit about their process. And again, you know, as part of a learning journey, we are celebrating all parts of that. You know, and it's, and it's important not to just kind of gloss over the fact that sometimes this is really hard. This is hard to do. It's hard, many adults struggle with project management. So this is really an important skill for them to learn. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of connections that they make. And you, you may have noticed some of the kids were actually, um, they're not co-presenting, I guess, but they did their projects together. And so like, and they, in some, of, some cases, like kids joined together because they knew they wanted to connect together. Other times, two different you know, two students were like, oh wait, we're working on the same project. Hey, let's come together and work on that. So they, you're making some interesting student connections. There's also actually some interesting connections with students who did this previous years. Some of these projects are actually building on previous projects that happened in former SIL, Jackson's, for example. Um, the other connections are with adults. So I think, I think this is true. If, if, if it's not, it's, it's close. Virtually every one of these students had some kind of connection to an adult who wasn't their parent and wasn't their teacher. And in some cases, those were connections to people outside, to doctors, to experts on concussions, to people running various organizations. They had to reach out and make those connections, and that in itself is also another huge piece of learning. And again, a skill that, and I can tell you, like worked with lots of high school, lots of college, a lot of them don't know how to do that. You know, they don't know how to actually go out and like ask somebody to like, hey, can I connect with you and learn about this, and then actually set up the time. And of course, they're eighth graders, so they had to work with most of you as parents if they were trying to coordinate the transportation for that. But those are really important correlates. So all three of those things are like critical skills that are on show, that they're showcasing tonight. So as you as we go through the rest of the night, there's a couple of things that I encourage you to, to look out for. So first of all, you will have a chance to, um, you know, if you have if your own child is here, you'll have a chance to go to, to go to their room and you'll see a series of presentations. If you don't have your own child, by the way, if you don't have your own child and you came tonight, thank you. Um, that's a really a really big piece of this. Yeah, big round of applause for those people. Um, I'm not talking about the teachers and me, I'm talking about other parents and other people. 
Because uh, you know, the other piece of this is having an authentic audience. It's having like a group of people who are really interested in what you're talking about and want to learn from you. Um, so you'll have a chance to go to those rooms and to, to hear them. You'll hear about their process. You'll hear about another, their sustainable development goal that they're connected with. That's something that we talk a lot about across the school, and so you'll hear about that. Um, and then finally, and this is the part I don't want you to miss, is after those presentations, there is more that's happening here. This room is going to get transformed. And when you come back in, I don't know, 45 minutes or whatever it is, there will be chairs set up, and there will be a series of presentations by students. And so you don't want to miss that part. They, they will end with a series of presentations. So again, I'm thrilled to have you all here tonight. And I think I'm turning this over to a, so I'm turning this over to Katie. Thank you, Mr. Silver. Now we have three presenters talking about what is SIL in three different languages. Please welcome to the stage Joshua, Ben, and Blake. Hello, guys. My name is Joshua. Hola, soy Benjamin, but in English you can call me Ben. My English name is Blake. So, what is SIL? SIL stands for Social Impact and Leadership. It's a class that's led by eighth grade English teacher, Miss Kelsey. Director of Scott Center of Social Entrepreneurship, Ms. Mack, and the Program and Research uh, Lead of Scott Center of Social Entrepreneurship, uh, Professor Fernandez. So. Um, it's a class that teaches us how to change the world for the better. Um, we learn about the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDG, which are some global issues that the United Nations wish to um, solve by the year 2030. Some example of that would be zero, no poverty, zero hunger, life below water, and life on land. Along the way, us eighth graders will also learn life skills that you won't usually learn in a traditional classroom setting. Skills like multi-source uh, multi research, self-advocacy, self-sufficiency, self and public speaking. Entonces, ¿qué significan las siglas SIL o en español ISL? Significan impacto social y liderazgo. El curso de ISL está dirigido por Ms. Kelsey, quien es la maestra de inglés de octavo grado por la maestra Fernández, quien es la líder del programa de investigación dentro de la organización llamada Centro Scott para el Emprendimiento Social, y por Ms. Maquela, quien es la directora de la organización Centro Scott para el Emprendimiento Social. <risa> en la clase de CIL nos enseñan cómo podemos cambiar y hacer un mundo mejor. Ahí hemos aprendido sobre los objetivos del desarrollo sostenible, U, ODS, que son un llamado de acción por la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para resolver problemas globales. Dichos objetivos se planean alcanzar en el año 2030. Algunos ejemplos de estos objetivos son el fin de la pobreza, el hambre cero, la vida submarina y la vida de ecosistemas terrestres. A lo largo del curso, nosotros, los estudiantes del octavo grado, también adquirimos nuevas habilidades que normalmente no se encuentran en un salón de clases tradicional. Desarrollamos habilidades como la investigación con múltiples fuentes de información, a abogar por nosotros mismos, a ser autosuficientes y a hablar en público. Uh,我们要向大家介绍的课程是SIL,在中文里面我们代表是社会影响力课程,所以这是一门教给我们八年级学生的课,也仅限于我们八年级。呃，在其他的学校你是并不可以学到相同的课程，然后这是一个我们学校的特殊课程。所以这些技能可以在呃呃来自多元的研究以及自我主张、自我独立的公开演讲，然后我们这门课的主要老师也是由Miss Kelsey 女士，然后包括我们 Scout Center 的负责和创创新人员。呃，什么是 SIL？ So SIL 会教会我们如何研究现在事物的一些。改变,比如说冰山的融化,以及天气的骤降,然后和土地的荒芜等之类的问题。在我们的第一节课上,我们学习了如何与homeless 
就是无家可归者，如何帮他们找到更好的归宿，然后如何让他们有工作，如何也让他们结婚生子，然后让他们像平常人一样生活，不会影响到社会的一些正常正常发展。所以这就是我们在 SL 课课堂上主要讨论的问题。My favorite part of SL is the process. This includes a variety of things, for example, um, from not knowing anything about social entrepreneurship to knowing it more than your parents. <laughs> um, you know, learning how to connect with organizations and your community, um, and also the teamwork and the effort that people put into the projects, and many more. Lo que más me ha gustado de la clase de SL ha sido ver cómo las ideas se convertían en acciones y realidad. Por ejemplo, mi mentor, el señor Stamos, nos sugirió a mi compañero de equipo y a mí la idea de donar alimentos de su clase optativa de cocina, una clase en la que mi compañero y yo ya asistíamos, a la organización que teníamos planeado apoyar durante nuestro proyecto de SIL. Aunque la idea no fue mía, el proceso de cuando de poder presenciar de cuando otra persona sugirió una idea y la oportunidad que tuvimos de convertirla en acción y realidad ha sido una experiencia muy inspiradora e inolvidable. Uh,我们大部分的学生以及我自己是从未接触过这门课程，然后大家也从未对自己有过了解，因为我们也不会在别的学校学到关于无家可归者的一些事情。所以对于我和我自己的项目来讲，呃，我们对于篮球的场地的
starting at four and five years old. School is intended to help students become their whole best selves. And to do that, you need to see how what you're learning in the classroom makes sense in your world and in your community. And so once we know ourselves, know others, and then we're getting proximate situations, then we combine those to create meaning. The world needs our students to build empathy, build collaborative skills, and meaningfully understand how to change it for a more just and sustainable and equitable world. And so these two Scott Center questions, what matters to you and what are you going to do about it, have become this like foundational and really inspiring way for children from the youngest ages to engage in real meaningful work. If you want to have a big impact on the world, like you want more justice in our social systems, you want a more inclusive, more diverse, fairer future for everyone. There is no better bag of techniques to go accomplish that than entrepreneurship. And that's why social entrepreneurship is like such a great combo. The biggest value out of social impact learning in the day-to-day -day curriculum for students is that it makes immediately real for them why their learning matters. <laughs> that school isn't just a place that you go to like do things that adults tell you to do during the day. That school is a place you go to learn how to be a community member, a citizen, a participant in the world. This is the type of thinking that, that we need to develop in students. A non-factory model, a model that's designed for the future. We haven't even touched what is possible with learning. We are just starting to think about what the role of school can be in partnership with what's happening in our bigger world. How do we help learners of all ages see the world as it is, imagine what it might be, and think about who they can partner with to make a difference? So this is my presentation, uh, Taking Action on Climate Change, presented by me, Styx. Now, let me tell you some things that matter to me. Well, something big that matters to me is climate change. Because it's, it's been something that I've worried about since kindergarten when I saw what people were doing to our planet, as in littering and warming up the atmosphere. What, am I, what I am doing about it is making people aware of the climate crisis at hand and how they can make a difference. Going more into detail, I know I'm boring, let me explain why I chose climate change as my SDG. If you don't know what SDG already means, it basically means Sustainable Development Goal. I've, told, I've chosen SDG number 13, climate change, because it reflects my deep concern for our planet, dating all the way back to my kindergarten days. I'm committed to raising awareness and educating others about the urgent need for climate action. By choosing this goal, I'm not only expressing my passion about this topic, but also contributing for a healthier and more sustainable planet. Now, who are already some people that are trying to make a difference? Well, here are some people that are already trying to make differences with the listed websites and more. One, one example is Help Protect Wildlife, where you can donate a specific amount of money to help protect endangered species from the climate crisis that we are creating and help them from not going extinct. So I know you're just like, whoa, what the heck? So let me explain. This is a diagram of my journey and process throughout my time working on this project. And it was a whole entire roller coaster of emotions I was getting myself into. So at first I joined the, I joined SAL a little bit late, a few weeks late, so I didn't know what to do. But then I partnered with someone, it was going great, we did a bunch of stuff, didn't end up working out, which is kind of a downer. Then I got stuck, but I was like, you know what, I've seen so many people have uh, talking about climate change, something I'm really passionate about, and make so many websites, so I'm like, you know what, I'll start a website about climate change. So I started that, it was going amazing. But then there was a whole entire roller coaster of emotions because I didn't know what to do, I got stuck so many times, all the plan, I didn't plan out any of my steps, and I kept doubting this would work. But then I figured out all the hard parts and then just started making it look pretty and made it how I wanted it to look. And then I finished and I'm so happy with the outcome. Now, 
What are some challenges I faced? Well, in every accomplishment, there are some ups and downs. And as you saw in the last slide, my journey was a roller coaster of challenges. However, I faced some challenges that I could, could have avoided, including not having all the steps planned out. This one had a huge impact on my work and accomplishing everything I wanted to do. One big way I could have avoided this one was to be asked for help from others. If I had asked for help, rather than thinking I could do this all by myself, I could have finished way faster. But yeah, moral of the story, don't be stubborn. But what did I learn about myself? Something that I learned about myself is that I can be a very stubborn person at times. When I started working on the website, I was not asking for help thinking I could do it all by myself. And as I saw on the last slide, this was a huge impact on my work ethic. But I asked for help for a after a while, and then it got so much better from there. Now, what did I actually do during SAL? And if you still don't know what SAL means, it basically means social impact and leadership. Some things that I did in SAL were talking to organizations. When I was talking to organizations, I was asking them about what do they do, if they want to help me with donations, and more. It was super fun and helped a lot with my website. Speaking of which brings me to my next thing, making a website. This is probably the best part of a sale. It was so fun and it gave me a lot of information and it made me feel good about myself because I taught others about things as well. But for the third thing, interviewing others. This one, uh, well interviewing others first of all about what they thought about climate change, how they think we can make a difference and all, so much more. This one was amazing because they gave me new point of view of things that I wouldn't even have thought of or didn't even see in the first place. It was amazing. And then last but not least, having fun. Best part of sale. Like like now what was the impact on the community and me? Both of the big impacts were something that I was working on toward the whole time creating awareness and making a difference. Creating awareness, this one was a huge first step. Creating awareness was a big goal I had for people to understand that there's a climate crisis at hand and how they can help stop it. That going into the second one, making a difference. If people, this one was a huge second step after creating awareness. If people didn't understand that there was a crisis and didn't understand that we can help it go away because we caused it, making a difference would be rewriting what we had created, the climate crisis. Last, but certainly not least, how will I impact others going forward? For one, my project will impact others by teaching them the effects of climate change and that we created the crisis. Another way that I will impact others is by teaching them ways on how to help with the climate crisis, climate crisis we are creating. And I also hope that this presentation has impacted you and helped you and helped inform you about the cli our climate crisis. For this slide, I just want to thank all, all of you who have helped me through this journey. Some people, some of these people are Miss Kelsey, Miss Mac, and uh, Miss Heather. These uh, these amazing people gave me so many ideas, kept me on task, and helped me with my research. And it was amazing to, for my mentors to help me with that. Some other people I want to thank are the people that I interviewed. Um, because these people gave me ideas and new views of things that I never would have thought of. Thank you. And lastly, thank you to Professor Fernandez for helping in the beginning. She was one of the people who had put up with, she was one of the few people who had put up with me and helped answer any questions I had. She had to leave early, but even though she left halfway through, she was the one who started this journey for me and many others who were struggling on their SIL projects. And if you wanna scan the QR code, for the website, just scan it, and then you can email me questions at CCA questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kevin Wang, and I'm here to talk about my SIL project, healthcare. What matters to me is access to quality healthcare. What I'm doing about it is building awareness for the need of, f about the need for well-being and connect people with, with organizations that's addressing this problem. Part one, what is the problem? 
What are the barriers to accessible healthcare? The barriers of lack of insurance, healthcare workforce shortages, geographic barriers, communication barriers, stigma and discrimination. Insurance is very expensive in the U.S., around $8,500 for personal coverage and $23,000 for family coverage. As you can see, American healthcare spending per capita is the highest out of these five countries. And with health insurance rising by 8% in 2023, health, health insurance is, is likely to rise again in 2024. Another barrier for accessible health care is accessible Medicaid. According to a focus group conducted by KFF Health News, some people found renewing and rolling into Medicaid a hard and lengthy process. Some, and some people don't understand health care or they experience language barriers. Therefore, a Vietnamese American Community Service Center was constructed in 2021 to improve health care accessibility in San Jose. Connection to SDG. We have come a long way since SDG 3 was introduced. There have been significant positive changes worldwide, especially in Asian and African countries. This was achieved with programs like Medicaid and similar programs in other countries, and a 69% increase in social coverage in lower income countries, and a 63% incre increase in lower middle class countries. Change makers. A change maker in the healthcare industry is Mark Cuban. He founded the Cause Plus drug company. It's a company that sells prescription drugs with transparent pricing. This is so. This would be like a how they price how they price their drugs. Mark Cuban is an American businessman and entrepreneur. He co-founded the company called Cause Plus Drugs with Dr. Alex Alex Oshmanishki, an advocate for transparent drug pricing. His motivation for his work is to challenge big pharmaceutical companies and bring better tra price transparency while not compromising on quality. Traditionally, prescription drugs are priced by manufacturers, pharmacy benefit managers, pharmacies, and the insured. His company then is different from other pharmaceutical companies because his, his drugs only has a 15% markup. Also, his company focuses on generic drugs instead of pricey brand name drugs. Part two, my SIO journey. This is my SIL journey map. So first I started with SDG 14, Life Below Water. Then I started over because I realized SDG 3 was better and then Walter joined me. Then we had our mentors. Then we had our mentor, Miss Maloney. She gave, us, she gave us a lot of ideas on what we should do. Then nothing happened for two weeks. No one responded and and then Gardner finally responded to me and gave me a lot of useful information. Then I had my SIL site visit to better process all this information. Then, and then I was very happy when I finished the research, research part. And then I had some presentation stretch and now we're done. For my project, I chose Gardner Health because they have years of experience with low-income patients. 50,000 in 2023, 50,000 patients in 2023, and 94% of their patients are 200% below the state poverty line. They have mobile health vans that goes to shelters to provide free medical treatment. They don't turn people away regardless of economic status. And they're, they're, also, they're also partnered up with organizations like Mali, Valley Medical, which handles the patients when Gardner doesn't have the resources to do so. And they partnered up with Catholic Charities of Santa Clara. Gardner set up, Gardner set up a clinic for the homeless at their Pope John the 23rd multi-service center. And all of these, and all of these hus organizations have hospitals in an accessible location, usually near public transportation or in a densely populated city which eliminates the need to drive. And some people don't have cars or are unable to drive. You can support these organizations you can support these organizations by donating, joining the organization, and or advocating for systemic change regarding healthcare. Helpful sources. These are some sources I use to get accurate information on my project. I got I reached out to Gardner Health for information on accessible healthcare 
I used data from the fo from a focus group conducted by KFF Health News. I got data from WHO and the United Nations website on SDG number three. Then I learned how accessible healthcare has impacted my community through a local news organization source like the San Jose Spotlight. When I was doing this project, I was also always thinking about how my project would impact the community. I intended to inform others about the lack of accessible healthcare and how to support my topic. But I didn't think I would learn so much about myself and how to get reliable data from s trusted sources. I also had to learn with feeling stuck with my project, which is playing Roblox. However, if I were to sum up my impact in two sentences, it would be people learning about healthcare and the import importance of affordable healthcare. How others can be involved in this project pro topic is donating slash joining organizations that advocate for accessible healthcare or voting voting and lobbying for systemic change to support accessible health care. And, and thank you to Ms. Maloney, Ms. Drumay, Mr. Jose Garcia, and my partner Walter. They've all supported me a lot on my SIL journey. Ms. Drumay and Mr. Garcia are my contacts at Gardner Health and they took time out of their work on a Friday so Walter and I could learn about their organization. Ms. Maloney took time in her busy schedule to mentor us. Her information and suggestions were always accurate and helpful. And thanks to Walter for playing Roblox with me in the back of the class. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Ellie Kang, and, I'll, and today I'll be talking about the importance of the English language learner's journey. I want to start off with a question. Have you ever felt lost? For me, I felt very lost when I came to the United States during 2019 from Korea. The obstacles that I encountered made me stuck in place, like not knowing English, having to adapt to a new environment, and not understanding classes, and not getting the help I needed. So I tried my hardest, and I recovered from all these obstacles. So for this project, I didn't want anyone to feel lost like me. What matters to me is I wanted to make sure that students with language barriers feel supported, safe, and never helpless. I didn't want anyone, to, anyone else to be stuck in life, and I wanted them to know that they will thrive so they would believe in themselves. And I am taking mul multiple approaches to help the students who are struggling with the English language. So today I am going to be sh sharing my whole journey about my SIL project from the start and to now. My sustainable development goal is number four, quality education. I think that everyone deserves a good education, so I started off my project with this SDG. My change maker was an organization in San Jose called Third Street Community Center. This organization helps kids and tutors kids who need help from other people with homework, reading, and any other stuff. Most of the kids there are from San Jose. Um, this is my process graph and first I didn't know what to do but I wanted to, I knew what I wanted to do in the end and the second dot was when I wanted to work it uh, I okay. <laughs> okay the second dot was when I started working with Max and everything was going well the fourth dot was when the third thought was on Third Street, the organization we were working with didn't respond and we couldn't do anything. The fourth thought was when we interviewed people from Third Street and the fifth thought was when we helped out teachers and students from first grade and the sixth thought was when we didn't actually get to volunteer at Third Street. But after that, the seventh thought was when we actually got to volunteer at Third Street. The challenges that I encountered was not knowing what to do if we didn't have anything to do, time management, having to make de big decisions and choices, cooperating with other people outside of school, and getting lost. Um, we overcame the challenges by reaching out again through email, always having a second resort if something didn't work, and talking and communi co communicating with my partner, Max. and. When I did some research about this topic, 
I figured out in the San Jose School District, only 42% of disadvantaged graduates get doesn't get the chance to attend a four-year university, but a college degree means just more than just learning. So people are struggling with barriers that can easily limit their potential. So we want to uh, make learning more accessible to disadvantaged people. So what did I actually do during this time? We made a better or relationship with the organization Third Street. We interviewed Alexandra from Third Street and we helped kids out in first grade and Third Street almost every week. The impact that we had was I learned how to tutor kids, like working with visuals, and they benefited from me by helping me with their homework. We are currently working towards making a morning club with the high school students coming in every morning to help kids in 6th and 7th grade, 6th, 7th and 8th grade with their homework and I want to give a big thank you to Ms. Kelsey and Ms. Mack for helping me with my ideas. Professor Fernandez who left early but she was a big help with to me by introducing Third Street Community Center to me. Ms. Scolton, which who I interviewed, Ms. Benefield, who is, was my mentor, Ms. Ha Young, who helped me prepare this slide, Ms. Jones, always listening to me ramble about my SIL project, Max, for always communicating with me, and my friends, mostly Maddie, for listening to my rambles. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackson. I'm an eighth grader at Hillbrook School, and I'm here to talk to you about my SIL project, Hillbrook Mental Health Week. Starting off with a little quote by Dan Millman, you don't have to control your thoughts, you just have to let them stop controlling you. And this is an extremely powerful quote, as it tells you, solving your problems in mental health isn't just as easy as taking some deep breaths and meditating. It just tells you, like, you can deal with this in so many different ways. Like, you just gotta stop letting your thoughts control you, and you'll live a better life. Um, big of a problem mental health is right now. Um, we're gonna do a little infographic. Um, in this picture, there are 47 students, and I just want you to take a little guess at how many of them will get a diagnosed anxiety disorder by the time that they're my age, 13. A dis an anxiety disorder is depression and anxiety. Those are two very common examples of an uh, anxiety disorder. Now, there are two spectrums that you could have answered this question in. You could have said, oh, all of them are gonna get a diagnosed anxiety disorder by the time that they're my age, or none of them do, or two or three are a very low number. But in actuality, it's about one fourth of them. 13 of these students will have a diagnosed anxiety disorder by the time that they're my age. And I just saw that as a huge problem and like, what could I do to fix it, as SIL is a perfect opportunity to do this. Now the problem I found is there is a lack of support for mental health in schools, and I decided what am I gonna do about it? Well, I'm gonna make a mental health week, uh, similar to the preventive solutions and puberty ed weeks that we provide here at Hillbrook School. Um, for the uh, SDGs that my friends touched on the other, in the other presentations, um, the ones that connect to my project are SDG 3 and SDG 4. Um, this is because SDG 3 covers good health and well-being and mental health is a very vital part of your normal health. And quality education is just here because we're going to be teaching students about mental health. And it's a lot of work that needs to be done in the field, but there's somebody who's already been doing it. Her name is Brene Brown. Um, in her words, she's a researcher, a storyteller, and a currently enraged Texan who has spent the last two decades studying courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy. You may have heard of her from her many Netflix specials and her many books. And um, yeah, she's really taking uh, initiative in the field of mental health. And uh, she's just extremely inspirational to me. And in my words, if I were to describe her in three, 
I would say that she's a public speaker, she's a change maker, and overall she's inspirational. Next. Well, you may be asking what causes mental health not to be supported in schools. Right now there's three main reasons. There's a shortage of teachers all over the country. There's a demand for a mental health professional in schools and there's a lack of mental health education in schools. Now all of three, all these three things am am amalgamate into one big problem of students are having really bad mental health and they're expected to show up to school, be extremely perfect and also learn at the same time, which can cause students to have a very downward spiral of mental health. Uh, well, what should schools do about it? What they should do is they should encourage students to talk about their mental health problems. They could set up a better mental health education, have a reasonable student to counselor ratio, which I will touch on in a minute, uh, provide mental health sick days and accommodations for students who are struggling, and assign a smidgen less homework so students just don't feel as overwhelmed at home as they are right now. But what they usually do is they get one school counselor and make anti-bullying posters. This doesn't solve the problem at all and it just makes mental health worse. And on the topic of school counselors, this is a little percentage pie chart of what uh, the student counselor to student ratio looks like at a public school. Um, it's 50, it's really not. It's at the average public school in the United States, there is a 99.6% student population and a 0.4% counselor uh, population. This is just a little uh, chart for the schools who have counselors. This is the percentage of schools who don't even have one. 86% of schools in the public schools in the United States do not have a counseling program. This is such a huge problem because, as I said in the earlier slides, one in four students will have a diagnosed anxiety issue by the time that they're my age. And if 86% of schools don't even provide a single counselor at their school, then these students don't get anybody to talk to and they just get suppressed and depressed in ways that they don't even know how to solve. And so my goal was to fix this problem. Now, what should I do about this? I could let the government be, have let them do their own thing. Uh, I could politely ask schools to just, you know, have another counselor. Uh, or I could try to create a week at Hillbrook where I teach eighth graders how to be educated on mental health and I meet with a bunch of people and, you know, plan a week. And I, I went with the latter. And this is my SIL journey. Now, you may be asking, what did you do during SIL time? It was mainly a mix of cool math games and Spotify. No, it wasn't. I actually had a really busy SIL time. I spent most of my SIL time emailing therapists, scheduling times to meet with my mentor, Miss Joan, and having meetings with Miss Joan about what the... Um, content of the week should be. And a little map of my SIL uh, journey is this. Uh, I started off with an entirely different project idea, then the ninth graders came and Maya in the ninth grade said, oh she tried to make a mental health week and I was like, oh my god that is so cool, that's my, that's my job now. And so I changed ideas, that's what the big tip is, and then I reached out to Miss um, Kelsey, and she set me up with uh, the principal of the school, Mr. Silver, and we had a meeting, and it went really well, and yeah. Then I got confirmation, like, this can actually be a thing. Then I reached out to a bunch of therapists, I waited for them to respond, and then I spent most of my time waiting, but then I planned my week, and now we have a finished product. Our finished project, our finished product is a, ex this is a little exoskeleton of what my mental health week is going to look like. Um, you can read it now or you could email me about what it's going to look like and what I'm going to teach students. But it, and we're going to have a panel with three therapists who I, who I thank very much for both meeting with me and uh, giving me advice on how I should start this week. Now, this is going to happen on the week of March 15th, and I'm really excited for this to happen. Uh, future impact on Hilbert community is, I hope that this will just start the, this will set the precedent for what mental health should look like in schools, and hopefully I get a better 
uh, or the Hilbert community gets a better mental health standard overall. Now, I have so many thanks to give out and I have such little time to do so, so I'm going to channel, channel my inner Eminem and start this. Uh, thank you, Miss Vanessa, who helped me get it ready for this presentation. Thank you, Miss Joan, my SIL mentor, for always setting up times to meet and meeting with me. Thank you, Miss Mack and Miss Kelsey, for always helping me with my project, my project next steps. Thank you, Mr. Silver, Miss Thorpe, and Miss Maisel, and Mr. Lavage, for helping me get the week from a plan to an actual idea. Thank you, Coach Bryden, Coach Mars, Miss Young, and Miss Deborah in the office for always being there to talk to me during my SIL break. And thank you to these th these therapists, Remy Fang, Melanie Went, who is actually a Hilbert parent, and Dr. John Pina, who is my personal therapist for helping plan the week and also being on the panel. Um, these are the sources that I used throughout my project. Um, I used the National Institute of Men Mental Health, the CDC's website, and the World Health Organization's website to all get the most accurate information needed. And the three therapists who thank you so much again for helping me and really helping me plan the week. Thank you for watching my SIL presentation and hopefully this gives you an, gives uh, you another account of what mental health should look like if it was supported. Thank you. We're so glad that you were able to join us tonight to see our eighth grade students turning ideas into impact. The Social Impact and Leadership Summit is not only a highlight of the eighth grade year, but it's also an example of what is possible when you put student voice and choice at the center of learning. We believe deeply that action and justice is the antidote to anxiety that all of us are feeling in this complex world right now. Students showcased their interests and passions combined with complex leadership and learning in so many different ways tonight. We hope you had a chance to hear not only from the keynote students, but also um, we'll take the opportunity to learn more about our Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Hillbrook School in the coming days, weeks, and months. Our vision at the Scott Center is to help learners of all ages see the world as it is, imagine what it might be, and partner with local communities to make a difference for people in the planet. That vision has never been more alive than right here, right now. And we have so many people to thank for the success of the eighth grade SIL Summit and the success of social entrepreneurship at Hillbrook School. Thank you to the incredible eighth grade team who put in time and energy every single week to make this class possible. Thank you to a whole crew of amazing mentors who met students one-on-one -on -one and helped them really believe not only in their project, but believe in the possibility of social change. Thank you to the senior leadership team at Hillbrook who have believed in this work from day one. Thank you to Kelsey and the other leaders at the Scott Center for taking this idea and turning it into a course that centered research and action and reflection alongside social entrepreneurship. Thank you to our founding donors, Shannon and Kevin Scott, who made this work possible more than seven years ago and continue to be such incredible advocates for this work, not only here at Hillbrook, but in our larger world. Tonight is an example of what happens when we believe in young people. There's so much work to be done and there are so many possibilities that still exist. And we know in many ways, this is just the beginning. At Hillbrook, we believe in educating the leaders of the future. And that is worthy, important, critical work today more than ever. Thank you again for joining us and being part of our evening and our summit. We can't wait to have you join for future events.